Okay, it's 1 p.m. I would like to call this meeting to order. The proceedings of this meeting will be recorded and made available on the internet. We can move on to item 1.2 of our agenda, which is roll call. And I'll ask our clerk, Jesse Clark, to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor Lamford. Are you present? I am present. Deputy Mayor Armstrong? Present. Councillor Franzen? Present. Councillor Braybrook? Present. Councillor Cadigan? Present. For staff, we have Donna Taggart, CAO Treasurer? Present. Steve Brockbank, Director of Emergency Services? Present. Evan Grieger, Director of Public Works? Present. Barb Waldron, Director of Building and Planning, CBO? Present. Adele Arbor, Planner? Present. Bianca Dragisevic, Deputy Clerk? Present. Amber Novak, Legislative Coordinator, Executive Assistant to CAO? Present. And Jesse Clark, Director of Corporate Services, Clerk is present. Okay, thank you very much, Jesse. I will move on to item 1.3 of our agenda, which is land acknowledgement and moment of reflection. We respectfully acknowledge that Trent Lakes and Peterborough County are located on the Treaty 20 Michisaugee Territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisaugee and Chippewa Nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty First Nation, which include Alderville, Beausoleil, Curve Lake, Georgina Island, Hiawatha, Rama, and Scugog Island First Nation. Trent Lake respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty First Nations are stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity and that they continue to maintain this responsibility and ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We will now take a moment to reflect on these principles and our duties and responsibilities as members of Council. Okay, thank you very much. We will move on to item two of our agenda, which is the disclosure of pecuniary interest. If any member of council has a pecuniary interest on the item on the agenda, please disclose it now or any time during the meeting prior to discussing anything you have an interest in. Seeing no hands, we can move on to item three of the agenda, which is the approval of the agenda, agenda as circulated. Entertain a motion. Councilor Franklin. For a mover and Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a second. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay, now we will move on to item four of our agenda, which is a closed meeting. We are putting this in a different spot today for various reasons. I will need a motion to be closed for the Ontario Municipal Act, section 2392, to discuss E, litigation or potential litigation including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board, statement of claim, and F, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, statement of claim, and legal opinion. I would entertain a motion to be closed. I see Councillor Cadigan for a mover, Councillor Braybrook for a seconder. I will call for the vote. All in favor? Motion has carried. We will be going into close now. I would entertain a motion to rise from our closed meeting. Councillor Fran for mover and Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. I would call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay, we can move on to item five of our agenda, which is business arising from the closed meeting. Item 5.1 is the adoption of the minutes from our closed meeting. I see Councillor Cadigan for a mover. Mm -hmm. Councillor Braver for a seconder. Any conversation about the minutes? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay. We can move on to item six of our agenda, which is the adoption of minutes of our regular council meeting of January the 16th, or statutory public meeting of January the 16th, and our special council meeting of January 25th. We can adopt them all with one motion, or we can adopt them all individually at the desire of council. I make a motion to adopt the that one motion. Okay. And the seconder is Councillor Cadigan. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay. We can move on to item seven of our agenda, which is committees on boards. Item 7.1 is the committee of adjustment from December 5th. Making a motion to receive. Let's see. Councillor Braybrook and the seconder is Deputy Mayor Armstrong. <clears throat> is there any conversation? I'm seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We can go to item 7.2 of our agenda, which is the aid on boards and council boards and committees. I don't know if anyone has anything to discuss. 
Seeing no hands, we can move on to item eight of our agenda, which is a statutory public meeting pursuant to the Planning Act. And we do not have one. Oh my. We can move on to item nine of the agenda, which is business arising from the statutory public meeting. We have none. And we can move on to item 10 of our agenda, which is presentations. Item 10.1 is Tammy Sigma, Manager of Corporate Data and GSI for the County of Peterborough. Tammy, are you on the line? Hi there, thank you. Thank you very much, Tammy. Go ahead with your presentation. I think we're restricted to 10 minutes, so we've 20 minutes, sorry, my apologies, 20 minutes. So try your best to stay within that. And I would advise council, please keep most of your questions to that end if you can, because it'll speed things up a little bit. Go ahead, Tammy. Great, thanks for the time to, uh, to share with you today. Um, I'm here to discuss Next Generation 911 and provide you a bit of an uh, overview of what Next Generation 911 represents and the impacts on GIS, which is uh, the work that I oversee. So if I can ask you to advance the slide. So we'll be covering the move from uh, Enhanced 911 to Next Generation 911, the roles and responsibilities between the various partners, uh, challenges that exist and some of the next steps. So if you can advance a couple slides here. Yeah, and one more, please. So um, to walk you through the, the move from E911, which is where we're at right now, I just wanted to start with a brief history on what 911 represents. And so it began in 1959 in Winnipeg with a triple nine number that began there. Uh, in the 70s, it tended to expand throughout most of Canada with uh, E911, Enhanced 911, taking place in the county in 1999. And so as we move forward, the keys of the system that, that are required, and on the next slide here, are the ability to locate a caller, the um, ensuring that a caller is never abandoned and that if they, uh, a call is dropped, that the call can be reconnected, ensuring that timely response can be provided universally to all and with the ability to bridge between responding agencies as needed. Next slide, please. So today's enhanced 911 system relies on a table-based system of street names and civic addresses referred to as the MSEG or Master Street Address Guide. And this provides street segments with street name and address ranges between each. And this is what is used by your emergency responders to get to a call. Um, the system was designed to support landlines and to take a copper call, a, a call from a copper line straight through to the dispatch center. Since the evolution of new services, the system has had to have band-aid solutions applied in order to locate cellular and voice over IP callers um, with wireless call routing based on the strongest, not necessarily the closest tower signal. So if you'll advance again. Um, the MSAG looks a little bit like the table shown here. So this is where the, um, the emergency responders or the, the dispatch centers can see your street name and the ranges that your address would fall within. Um, as the call comes in, it picks up that information and then transfers it along on a dedicated phone line for, um, for the uh, responders to be able to get back out to the street in the right location. So you can advance through a couple of slides here if you would. And then the next one. So the E911 call uh, is taken from the caller, whether they're on a landline, a cellular, or a voice over IP, or a VoIP call. Uh, it's taken through to the primary public service answering point, or PSAP. There are a lot of acronyms related to, to 911 service, so I'm, I'm trying to keep it uh, as clear. If I, if I uh, start talking in too many acronyms, stop me. Um, this is where you'll typically hear that police, fire, or ambulance, and then from there, in our case, the North Bay OPP will tear it out to a secondary public service answering point, uh, which is where it, it then arrives at your fire dispatch or your police dispatch or your paramedic. And then they will, will call out the actual service responders from there. And so the next slide, actually we can advance through two. Yeah. So this is what they'd see in the trucks. And then the delay issues that exist within a system that's trying to, to meet these two sort of masters now, is that there can be data issues either with inaccurate or incomplete data, data that's past its best before date, um, places where we may have missing data. Um, and a key issue is where you've got different agencies, Bell, the various uh, PSAPs or dispatch centers and the responders that are using different data. And then 
wireless phones that are not actually using the GPS location of the caller, but rather, as we said, the, the strongest signal um, to the cell tower. And so that can slow things down as well. If you're using a voice over IP call, um, it it's, uses a registry system. And so your voice over IP is registered to an address. And if you take that voice over IP number with you to, to say um, uh, a winter residence in a different place and you don't update that system, it may have the wrong address connected to the system. Next slide, please. So next generation 911 or NG911 represents uh, the biggest fundamental change to the 911 system and the ability to get emergency service providers since the invention of the telephone. It's not an understatement. This effort involves a complete rebuild of the entire 911 system from the ground up, including everything from your transmission lines that were analog and taking a call from your landline through to your dispatch systems and processes that were built to use that analog information. Um, to the GIS data that, that will build, um, provide locations for all of your callers, to the geodetic call routing that will get the trucks to the location. And so next slide, please. Your E911 to nine, uh, NG911 will take and replace that, that original analog network now with an internet protocol IP network and use GIS as the foundation to locate the calls. So as I said, it, uh, it translates that, that old that old uh, analog system through to a digital and um, ensures that those like near 90% of callers now that are coming in on a cellular voice over IP call will be able to get the call located to the right spot. Next slide, please. In 2017, the CRTC directed that all telephone and mobile wireless companies update their networks in order to be ready to provide next generation 911 services. And next slide. And so the timeline that's relevant here is that in 2022, March of 2022, the networks were upgraded and they're now 911 or NG911 capable and ready and tested. The dates that are coming now are March of 2025 that will require a decommissioning of the 911 network components that are not going to be a part of the NG network. So that means that the the dispatch centers, the PSAPs need to be ready for that now. They can't uh, they won't be able to use the old the old systems as they were, and they're all working through those upgrades as we as we speak. And then following on the heels of that, in a period of 2025 to 2027, they'll be rolling out the GIS upgrades, uh, running two systems side by each for a period of time, and then using the addressing standards to, to geodetically um, arrive at a call. And so there's no actual dependency between the launch of the NG911 services in Canada and the work required to prepare for the future spatial call routing using uh, the, new, the new standards. However, we need to get ready for it because it's coming. So if you can advance a couple more slides. Yeah. So the roles and responsibilities, the roles and requirements in this new system are, uh, they, they require a foundational paradigm shift. So the technology, as we've said, that's going to change. And then the data used in it will also require significant changes. And there are um, there are standards set out that are being reviewed. So the technology depends on the use of this GIS data, whereas previously there have been um, different pieces used by different players. So if you can advance one more. Making the data ready for Public safety grade 911 response includes the what, how, and who. The content needs to be upgraded, so we need uh, we need to gather new information, ensure that the data that we have meets the standards that are required, and that we have all of the various attributes to the information that the system um, has to draw on. That the data is as accurate as accurate as it is required that it's going to be maintained to a level of currency that's needed, and that it's complete. And then operationally, the how, that we've developed the right procedures, the responsibilities, manuals, um, the data management behind this. And then the who, the organization or the data governments, data governance that will outline the roles and responsibilities for the various different players, the ownership, the timelines, um, and then ideally establishing agreements between us. So if you can advance again. So NINA is the National Emergency Number Association and they exist out of the United States and have developed a number of different standards that need to be applied for this 911 system, this next generation system. Um, for the GIS perspective, what we care about are the data that needs to be supplied to the system and how it 
needs to be sent. And so there are five required data sets in this system. The road center line, which we've been working on for a number of years and, uh, and are fairly confident in. However, there are discrepancies between the various different organizations that exist at this point. And so we're working through cleanup with those groups to ensure that the data that's provided will match and leave no one behind. Um, what is new are the site and structure addresses for us. And while we've maintained GIS data for addressing uh, for a cartographic standard, it has not been 911 verified, and so this is a, a piece that will need to be reviewed and, uh, and readied for this system. And then there's a couple of different boundaries uh, overlooking the entire area and then the areas of the various responders. Um, and then if I can ask you to advance here. And one more, actually. So then there are also strongly recommended and recommended data sets that fall within there and they will include various different boundaries, um, many of which we have, but will want to be reviewed with the organizations to ensure that they accurately represent the boundaries for your responders. And then uh, other background information like roads, railroads or, um, or trails, footpaths, um, mile markers, um, hydrology, things like that, that will be important for your responders as well. You'll note I highlight the address points here, and the reason I draw attention to that is because while the address points are a required data set, the container that is sent um, has to be sent. It has to, we have to send a container that is labeled address points. However, uh, we don't have to fill that container with all of the data at the outset of the project, and we can add to it as address points have been verified and, and confirmed. Um, for me, the, the most important thing is ensuring that we're not sending your responders down the wrong fire route and delaying service, that we've got the accurate information because um, where address points don't exist, it will revert back to the road center line, but the address points are, especially in a rural area and a remote area, um, like the county represents, so important to get people accurately to the right place. So if you can advance one more. A further consideration are the sub-addressing or indoor positioning data that the system can draw on and so in our uh, in our area the sub addressing would be important in an area like a campground where you have one primary address for a property and then sub addresses for the actual units where you might have uh, a resident of that unit calling for uh, for emergency service for uh, a resident um, or possibly assisted living facilities where you've got multiple indoor addresses um, to to locate someone correctly to the right place and so these recommended and strongly recommended um, data sets can grow over time. They aren't required at the outset. And so this gives us an ability to ramp up and, and better meet the needs of the system. And the system is built to hold it, which is the nice part. Uh, if you can advance again. And one more. So the challenges that the system um, offers are public expectations, the unknowns, and the funding. Um, the meeting the public expectation, it's important that throughout this transition that the 911 continues to act as one thing. It's the way that the public sees it, uh, despite the fact that the system is actually built on quite a few num quite a few various different players that have different needs and different roles and, and need to work collaboratively to ensure that it happens. And so as we move forward, this is what we're, we're seeking to maintain. And then the reliable, consistent response that people are used to, the ensuring that callers are never dropped and that should a call uh, be disconnected for some reason that the 911 can reconnect back. And so some of the misconceptions related to this are, um, are the belief by people that you can make a cell call from absolutely anywhere whether you have cell service or not. Um, people will need to have a cell signal in order to make a call. It's not going to connect by satellite unless you have a satellite phone. Um, and that uh, and that the texting to 911 is something that you may hear about, but at present, the, the texting to 911 will occur at a, at a later date as the system rolls out. So it's not going to be texting for all. So just to be aware of that. Um, if you can advance again. Uh, challenges that the, the transition will present for us include the need to address the new data standards and expectations of the system. Um, ensuring that the processes, policies, and procedures that are required are developed and built in and understood by all. And that includes everything from the way that the addressing happens in local offices like your own and are passed through to the county so that we can pass it through to the, uh, to the dispatch agencies. And um, ensuring that we fill the holes where there is unvalidated or missing data and, and address points. Um, 
addressing the long update cycles. So in some cases, weeks or months have transpired before data gets updated and then um, addressing timelines that are a little uncertain at this point. So there are parts of the, the transition that are still being developed. So as we get closer to those dates, the timelines or the, the deadlines will become firmer, but at this point, we're still trying to work towards some unknowns there for us. If you can advance again. Um, I know that what matters to you is, uh, is the financial impact, and so there, I can't tell you what this will be. There, there will be new um, agreements that I would expect that you'll be asked to sign. Uh, I can't tell you what this will, will mean for you. Uh, to my understanding, the OPP has forwarded a letter back in the fall of 23 advising that they have upgraded their systems to be next generation 911 compatible and that uh, new agreements will be forthcoming. And so I, I can just say that I would expect that you will see costs attached to that and I don't know what they'll be. Um, on the next slide, the CRT has uh, identified that they do not provide funding related to next generation 911. However, the Ontario government has had announced a $208 million funding platform over three years that rolled out in April of 22. However, it was only available for PSAP transitioning, so the transitioning of the actual dispatch centers, and this is something that the county was not eligible for because we don't operate a dispatch service. So um, in my in investigations, there's no other funding that's available in Ontario related to data preparation for this. Um, if you can advance again. The next steps uh, as, as we're working through this include a, a working group on, if you can advance one more slide for me. Um, so the, the working group was established last year. We have met a couple of times to discuss what next generation 911 means and where we go from here. We've included players from the county, local municipalities, First Nations and city. Uh, one, of the, one of the goals that I'd like to see us move forward um, sooner than later this year is the development of a joint powers agreement that will outline the roles and responsibilities of the various players that are involved so that we can, um, you can know what we're doing and we can know what you're doing and we can hold each other to account that way. And then working through GIS data verification. Um, yeah, if you can advance one more, please. So the NINA standards, uh, as I mentioned, this is what we're basing our GIS efforts on. Um, other components of the 911 system are based on other standards, but uh, GIS relies on a couple of documents here that have been working their way through the CRTC for a couple of years now, and they really do get um, analyzed with a very fine tooth comb with the goal of ensuring that Canadian requirements are met in the system that was developed in the States. And so, <clears throat> Uh, updates have been provided. They've they've worked their way through Nina, and uh, currently, a formal decision is expected from the CRTC in Q1 of 2024 to adopt the Nina model and direct the incumbent local exchange carriers or ILEX, um, the major telephone companies that existed prior to the introduction of local competition, to use these standards. And then, uh, if you could advance one more, please. So the NINA GIS data goals include, uh, as I mentioned, ensuring that we've got the right content, ensuring that the accuracy of the data, both horizontally, so in space left to right kind of thing, or vertically up and down ultimately, uh, will be met, and then that uh, the currency of data changes are uh, are met. So the NINA recommends, um, they don't require, they don't have any teeth to, in, to force us to do so, but they do recommend strongly that data errors be resolved within 72 hours of identification. And what this represents is should a, should a responder in the field uh, identify that there's a mistake, that they have some issue arriving at the right location because of the data, that gets sent back through, um, in our case, Bell, and then back to us. And so then we would need to work with your uh, staff there to ensure that the, the issues, whatever they be, whether they're in our data and or the field, that they get it resolved as quickly as possible so that that, that doesn't continue. And then uh, the next slide there is where do we go from here? So the action plan that we've laid out includes education, so presentations to councils like the county and yourselves, um, updating the CAO's working group on um, information that is identified and then speaking with staff through groups like the working group, uh, resource planning to ensure that we're working through as much as we can um, in our GIS offices, any possible issues that are found in the data uh, so that we can 
clean those up as quickly as possible. But then we have also identified in the 2024 county budget a request for two field staff to go out in the summer to start that field verification of the address points to ensure that the data that we have is the data that's correct. Um, collaboration will be critically important in this and not just between county and township, which uh, which we feel we have good relationships with your staff and they, they work well, but also with neighboring municipalities because our data is going to have to match not only within the county, but between the county and our neighbors to ensure that the calls don't end at our borders and that uh, responders can ensure that they can travel between. We also work with the Eastern Ontario GIS user group to, uh, to get the best advice and the best practices between our colleagues and ourselves. Uh, we attend regular CRTC meetings. I have staff that are at one right now. Um, we work with our dispatch centers, uh, Bell. The, we, we review the needed documents as they come out, and uh, we also work with emergency agencies, and we'll continue to do so. And then we also see the need to develop agreements and policies and procedures so that this can can be an ongoing situation. So, um, so that's my my presentation to to give you a bit of a background on NG911 and where we're going from here. And uh, if you can advance, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now or in future. Okay, Tammy, thank you very much for your presentation. Does anyone on council have any questions? I'm CEO, Deputy Mayor Armstrong, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I, Thank you very much. <laughs> I know. Um, thanks, Tammy. Um, complex subject, great big black box to me. But uh, I guess my question is, it sounds like, is every county in the country creating their own GIS? I mean, obviously, you've got some standards and templates and all of those things that you need to adhere to, so there's consistency. But is this something that's being done at the local level, I'll say county or whatever, throughout yes. the country? Yeah, sorry, through you, uh, Mary Lamb said yes. It, uh, it's occurring nationwide. Uh, the same timelines apply throughout Canada. Um, the, the data that's needed at our, our level is needed everywhere throughout Canada. And the... Um, the way that the system is built, it would should there ever be a should there ever be an issue at a local dispatch center? So should there be some tornado that knocks out a local dispatch agency, they can have a relationship with an agency elsewhere, and the data could then be picked up in Victoria, BC, if they needed to, and dispatched out of there because the data will be available nationally. So yeah, it's a uh, it's being worked on by quite a few different players in quite a few different places to ensure that it rolls out at the same time in the same way yeah if i can just follow up um because of the consistency across all of these and the sharing um you know let's say that county of peterborough was at some future time amalgamated with northumberland that those two databases could be smashed together and that would be a fairly easy task yeah and the the because we'll be working with our neighbors the data will match up it will have to match up on our edges and our boundaries so that yeah the data um what we'll be gathering will need to go to the central aggregator anyway and that's uh, in our case in ontario it'll be bill um, that will be taking our data and northumberland's data and city for the lakes data in the cities and they'll be gathering it together into one central database and then that's meant to to flow back there's still some fine tuning there, but that's meant to flow back to the dispatch agencies. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Thanks. I just have a, one little question myself, but I mean, we're still gonna have some remote areas in our municipality that has no signal for your cell phone, so that means they don't get a 911 calling? Um, in in the same way that uh, that you're not going to get a, a cell signal if there's no if there's no service you'll need to be in an area where a cell signal is possible in order to place that call but a landline will still be a landline so um they're not taking the landlines away per se it, the calls tend to i think roll through your your landline in my case it, like where i live the landline was upgraded to a voice over IP service through through Bell um, a while back. So it's not so much a copper signal and an analog signal at that point. It's it's a digital signal that sort of masks itself <laughs> as, uh, as the, the landline signal. But um, there, is, there are projects taking place through EORN to upgrade the cell service in a number of places. Um, so along roads and, and in populated centers you should be able to find signals in most places 
in the next few years if you haven't already. And uh, and if you're in a remote area in the backwoods, then the, it still will be a, an issue and, and you still will need to be able to find a cell signal the same way you do today. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? I'm seeing none. Tammy Sikma, thank you very much for your presentation. I look forward to this being implemented across our country and I think this is a necessary next step. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we can move on to item Oh, I need a motion. I need a motion to receive. The Councillor Cadigan uh, for a motion to receive, I'm assuming. Yeah. And Councillor Raybrook for a seconder. Any other conversation? I can see none. I will call for the vote. All in favor. <clears throat> that motion has carried. Okay, we can move on to item 10.2 of our agenda, which is Taylor Logan, uh, the project manager for Greer Galloway Consulting Engineering for our road needs study. Go ahead, Taylor. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm here today on behalf of Greer Galloway to uh, present our 2023 road needs study. Um, you could just proceed to the next slide for me. I'd appreciate it. So, uh, municipality of Trent Lakes existing road infrastructure, you guys are mainly comprised of a surface treated. Your roads are 185 kilometers of surface treat. That includes both surface treat and paved sections. Um, you have 103 kilometers of gravel. Mainly your, your roads are rural, lower, lower AADT roads. Uh, you don't have super high volume or large, you know, multi-lane roads going through your, I your municipalities. You may need to clarify what an AADT is. So that's your uh, annual average daily traffic count. So that's your number of vehicles through on a, on a, on a daily average. Um, most of your roads are often uh, you're adjacent to agricultural or wooded land in this in this case your majority of your cottage roads your back gravel roads and stuff like that are wooded area uh you guys your your ditching is in relatively good shape and uh most of your roads have adequate drainage you could proceed to the next slide please uh so the basis of our review was the uh this is kind of a list of stuff that we look for to determine what your roads would be rated for. So, you know, there's the identification of substandard horizontal and vertical curves. Majority of the time, they result from lay of the land. There's a lot of curves and hills and stuff that are generally unavoidable unless you put a significant amount of uh, money forward to, you know, level and, and correct uh, existing conditions. Uh, we also look at the assessment of the drainage conditions. That's crucial to longevity of your roads and also the potential improvements for that. Uh, generally, the roads are adequate throughout. Some issued on the less traveled gravel roads, but uh, majority was, was, was fairly standard. Uh, the identification of surface deficiencies is also something we look at. That includes flushing, rutting, cracking, segregation, distortion of potholes. Uh, additional consideration was given to you know, base defects, so you get frost, frost heat, boils, that sort of stuff. That's you know not something that's attributed to surface wear or surface itself. Um, you would primarily see alligator cracking or distortion in the the road surface. You know, rutting from large trucks, that sort of thing. If you could proceed to the next slide, please. So we put together kind of a 10-year asset management plan. Uh, your roads, roads are analyzed for rehabilitation primarily based on three factors, your traffic volume, existing condition of the road, and then your cost of rehabilitation. There's cost and benefit. So that's uh, the, the cost and benefit portion of that is, you know, if it's a gravel road, is it worth surface treating it? If it's surface treated, is it worth paving it? That sort of thing. Or is it to stay as it is? You could go to the next slide, please. So this is a list of our uh, recommended roads for the hardtop improvement plan. These are not the entire roads. These are generally sections as listed in the to and from column. Uh, you have sections on Galway Road, Kennedy Drive, Barcroft Road, Mississauga Dam Road, uh, Quartha Hideaway Loop, McKee Ave, Darvell Lane, Barcroft Road, Darvell Road, Henry Street, Another section of Barcroft Road load uh, lower than the previous Browns Lane and Fulton Lane. 
So those would be all your roads under your hard top improvement plan that we would have immediately identified. And uh, of course there's the recommended treatment. We have single surface treatment overlay, double surface. There's a variety there as well, if you guys wish to review them. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, this would be your gravel road improvement plan. This is a one to three year plan. Typically we don't do one to five or one to 10 year plans for gravel as your resurfacing and grading is, is ongoing yearly and annually. So uh, these were the roads that were mainly identified, uh, sections of Canes Lane, West Clear Bay Road, Charlie Allen Road, White Boundary, Boundary Lane, Hunts Line Road, Ken's Road, and Key Ave, Parkside Drive, Tai Mountain Road, two sections of that, White Valley Road and Bass Lake Road. Again, majority of those recommended treatments were sort of gravel resurfacing. That's more of the cost beneficial solution. You don't really have the traffic volume there to warrant surface treat and pave. So uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, so typical rehabilitation methods that we look at include crack sealing, that's sort of a one to three year sort of extension of your surface that just seals water penetrating through your, whatever your surface would be, surface treat or, or uh, pave would be the primary solution that would be used on. Uh, microsurfacing, that's sort of like a fog seal, very thin, thin layer of uh, fine granular uh, would be placed over with your asphalt tar. It's sort of a 10 year fix, double surface treat, pad overlay, and then rural full depth reconstruction are three others that we would look at. All those 10, 15 and 20 year solutions. Uh, those would be your full depth re reconstruction would obviously be your granular, your surface treatment, all of that would be completed under that. If I could have the next slide, please. Conclusions for basis our view of all your uh, road network. High volume roads are generally in adequate condition with adequate drainage. Those are the roads that would contain, you know, would sustain your greatest loading. Obviously, large trucks, higher vehicle average counts. Um, you know, the municipality should emphasize drainage and subsurface conditions. Cut the shoulders when necessary. If you get that hill of gravel sort of on the side of the shoulder that retains water on your shoulder that can be detrimental to your your road surface itself uh you know and, and ensuring during rehabilitation that you have a proper cross section proper cross fall uh, so that your water does get off the surface and into the ditches where it needs to be uh, the township should review the existing network annually in the spring and determine if any conditions are changed generally that's a great great time of year to tell if you are having structural or any major issues? Obviously, it's pothole season, so that's pretty, I've noticed straight, a couple. pretty straightforward. <laughs> and it's been one of those years where it's been freezing and thawing, so I'm sure they'll be very prevalent this year. If I could have the next slide, please. This is an example of a typical road cross section. You know, you have two percent cross fall from your center line. Uh, typical ditching, three to one horizontal and vertical. Uh, that's that would generally be cut back to tie into your existing grade. Uh, double surface treatment is shown here. We list it as OPSS 304 and 1150. That's just what the specification for materials, how it's supposed to be done and what's expected to be done. And uh, obviously your under below that would be your granular A. And then for typical rural full reconstruction, you'd pulverize your sub subsurface, including the surface below. You top that with your granular A, and then you build up from there with your new surface. So, uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So, another key thing too with the road needs studies is continue and extend your traffic counting program. This this helps to determine your level of service on the road. Primarily, uh, if you if you don't have the traffic counts, you know, in this case, we had to do quite a bit of assumption. You'll notice a lot of roads are listed at the same average count. We, do, we don't have the background information there to, to really break down the roads. So with our roads need study, we set out counters in 25 locations and that helps to start bring down and help decide what your actual average totals are. 
but uh, you know, working on adding that many roads, 25 roads, 50 roads, whatever it is per year, does help build that database, and that can really help tell, you know, between what roads need the most attention and which roads you can get away with leaving in the condition they are currently a little longer. So typically uh, when you get above the 400 average to daily total, that's your uh, kind of significant tipping point where it's worth looking at surface treating it. You get a little better wear life out of the surface, less less maintenance with granular, and then beyond that, you, you'd look at paving it. So. Could I have the next slide, please? So typical conversation that comes up is people want their gravel road paved or surface treated. So, you know, as I said before, common indicator is, is 400 vehicles and above you would surface treat. Uh, that's where your your maintenance outweighs uh, the, the cost of uh, the actual conversion to surface treat. Uh, your returns are are lower on that road if you don't uh, if if you don't up, if you upgrade it prior to the 400 vehicles a day. So uh, you would obviously you would review your drainage, your base conditions, and your cross section, and then if you determined if you need to increase the speed on that road or or you can keep it the same that's another factor too if you could advance to the next slide please if uh if anybody has any questions feel free to ask them thank you taylor anyone on council have any questions of taylor Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. I feel like I have to dunce cap on Jay. I have no <laughs> questions. Um, I know nothing about this area. So okay. Really, any questions? So there are two. The first one is how much of that road work can be done internally? And I guess it's a question to both you as well as to Evan. I mean, can we do our own crack sealing? Do we do any of this, or do we have to contract it all out? Evan, what what can you guys? generally take care of the house. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Armstrong, Deputy Mayor Lambshead. Um, unfortunately, it's quite limited, um, especially when you look at crack sealing and stuff like that. There's quite specialized equipment that needed, um, especially training and stuff like that. So your crack sealing is a hot tar, so it'd be a whole thing there sort of thing. So um, typically, municipalities don't get involved with that. Sometimes we'll do some patching and padding that we could do for surface treatment prep that was referenced in there. So we try to do as much as we can in-house, Unfortunately, with crack sealing or like surface treatment or doing an actual paving, we don't have the equipment. And to get that equipment, the initial capital cost wouldn't be worthwhile. So it depends. But, no, that's yeah, a fair question. Right. Sorry, and just to add on, we have tried. Um, there's different materials that if you're doing, you can do a little bit of crack sealing. So on a smaller scale, there's materials in the market that you can go and get. And the guys, I actually, we did some this summer on Adam and Eve. Or it's just sort of okay let's see how this works and it's not something you do for a full road but if you're noticing there's just this localized area or something it would it, it seems to have worked um i'll see how it looks in the spring sort of thing that's sort of your big see how it goes through the winter and after the spring thaw you can really see how well that treatment actually worked but we're always looking for opportunities to do in-house um but. Great, thank you. my second question um i know at the county level there's some focus on active transportation so that in particular county roads can be utilized for many different purposes including bikes and pedestrians etc it's less of an issue i think less of a priority for our municipal roads but at the same time you know we've got lots of cottagers who walk the roads walk their dogs yep. etc um, some cycling etc so do we factor that at all into our consideration of road condition uh, and rehabilitation um uh, we in our case, it, that wouldn't be considered just for the road need study as we kind of typically look at a road's need study in respect to an MTO type manual. There's very specific criteria laid out as to what to look for and, and what sort of rating would, would come from that. Mm -hmm. That's not something that we would look at. That would be more what a municipality would look at and consider, you know, if we're putting shoulders on this road or we're surface treating, is it worth surface treating or paving the shoulders so that, you know, these pedestrians, you know, have areas to walk their dogs and, and cycle and whatever else they they choose, right? So I wouldn't necessarily say you'd put like bike lanes or anything in, you know, on uh, on some of your cottage roads, but uh, potentially widening the actual platform of the road to allow a little more, you know, room for vehicles to pass and 
that that's also a consideration that can be done it's just uh, this is what's the need for it what's the demand for it and mm -hmm. uh, that would be sort of a I guess sort of a petition on a local level in those certain areas where you're where you're actually rehabilitating a road would, would maybe play more of a part in that so if i can add on to that i think that might be a consideration as we look at uh, capital plans on a yearly basis uh, have that perspective on some of those uh, projects as well as to whether they might be, you know, might be advised, might be financially sound and also advisable. Uh, so I, I think that some of that will come from the new advisory committee knowing the composition on that. <laughs> that's true. It's, I mean, that's a, not a bad idea. That's the, the county's doing. If it's a major rehabilitation on the road, they provide a, a larger top. So the active transportation lanes on both sides. So yep. It's a good good thought. Any other questions? Go ahead, Councilor Brown. I, I, I was asked uh, <clears throat> through you, Mayor, to I guess the beach has been uh, uh, have there been any thought about the clear way? Thank, thank you, Councillor Franz, and through you, Mayor Lamb said to Councillor Franz, and yes, so um, as I advised when I was doing the budget, I am working on a firm policy for gravel to surface treatment. And when that's completed, then I'll review Clear Bay. I know there's also questions on a section of Galway Road as well as South Salmon. So um, I'm gonna look at everything holistically. Um, and then as Taylor mentioned, continue to hopefully gather some more ADT data because that actually really informs your decision on, okay, is this, is this meeting certain criteria and stuff like that? So um, at this time, I don't know what the ADT was on Clear Bay, West Clear Bay specifically, but it's something that we're working on and we're gonna create a policy that so moving forward, we have, okay, these are the criteria that need to be that sort of thing moving forward, so. I think that's a great idea. I mean, the more information you have, the better you can predict what roads are gonna to need to be built. Go ahead, Councilor Gallagher. And to that point for you, Mayor, do we have traffic counting equipment? Thank you, Councillor Cadigan, through you, Mayor Lamb said to Councillor Cadigan, right at this point, no, we don't have traffic counting, so it's something that we would consult out. It's, it's something that um, typically you would just have a consultant do it and they sort of run it or they do it a fairly low price to have, basically you need another person on staff sort of thing to run that program. So this way you can do a traffic account on a fairly reasonable price and they go out and handle the issues and anything like that, so. Any other questions? Councilor Briggs. Through your mayor, we may as well run the gamut. Might as well. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Uh, these, these are, uh, thanks very much, Taylor. These are more general questions that I've received from residents yep. um, who have reviewed the, um, the agenda. Uh, how did you establish uh, what roads would be included in your improvement plan? Um, so our, our assessment of the roads includes driving each section of road and then from there we take the criteria and break it down into our spreadsheet and it's basically a numerical process that happens and gets processed through the software and gives us you know a, a general rating on each road that you would see that then ranks it one after the other so it's through visual inspection and it's through the criteria laid out through the mto assessments um, again the big driver is your your average traffic count if you don't have that data then it kind of it kind of skews the report so to speak so it's it, we we worked with evan and kind of came to an agreement on what what level of uh, the traffic is and your speed limit should be on those roads to kind of try to bring the the scope into more what you would would expect to see for roads that actually need the maintenance because sometimes it can it can be skewed and you know a road that was worked on maybe seven or eight years ago shows up back in this list just based on the size of it how large it is the cost to look after that whole section of road if it's not replaced if it's not maintained through you know microsurfacing crack sealing that sort of stuff so it, our report basically serves as a guideline to try to help the municipality with you know budget budget wise it's not the all governing document as to this road needs done on this date it's it's up for some sort of you know leeway i guess and and council and, and community members too can really put the deciding factor on you know the road needs paved you know it, it maybe maybe it's a residence road that has 15 people on it but it hasn't been touched in 15 years well maybe it's maybe it's due but it just doesn't have that high traffic count or or uh 
the, the, it's not going to get the attention that it needs basically so our report isn't all governing but it's definitely to help assist with budgeting but again you're going to get the odd road that's missed that obviously the residents feel that it needs attention needs needs rehabilitation or or repair at least so okay. Okay. follow up to that uh, thanks mark um so in your in your answer there that that was my next question was uh i guess a lot of it's driven from the municipality uh, being evans uh Evans' input is as that's far as, that's 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 correct. It would know, come from it would come from council's input, Evans' input, community members. Right. It would it would also help drive. You know, maybe the road's not on the list. Maybe it's you know just shortly down out outside of our ten year plan because it's basically it takes the top section of the the most you know roads that need the most attention and puts them at the top. There might be some just below that that are are really in need of of repair, but it's it's just how our our system ranks it is all right uh another question was um just because a, a road is not listed on the on your report correct on uh, your study doesn't mean it's not going to get the attention if if need be and that would that would be driven by uh your yeah thank you thank section. you councillor raver through your mayor said yep you're exactly right just because it's not on there doesn't mean it won't be done and as Taylor mentioned in reference in the presentation, every spring you're looking at roads because some some roads degrade quicker than others and stuff like that. And I'm always, from my point of view, engineering, you need to have some common sense. You need to be looking at what's actually happening on site. You can't just run off of what certain studies had said from previous years sort of thing. You got to balance that. And that's, um, yeah, that's one of the things I like about the job is, you know, things are changing, conditions are changing, so you can you know, look at different options and stuff like that. So. One more, question. one more, and that's it. Um, just to do with uh, the budgeting and whatnot, the numbers that you've you've put out in your list of the roads, the estimates. In your experience, uh, Evan, have you found that uh, the estimates are high and they've come in under budget, or or can you comment thank, on that? Thank you, Councillor Ray, for you, Mayor Lambshead. Um, two, three years ago, four years ago, yes, I would say that. Unfortunately, now with the way prices have come in on tenders, it's <laughs> It's it's really a crapshoot. You don't really know. I mean, he the, the numbers that they're using are used from our 2023 tender, so they're fairly accurate that way. Um, but you're finding, you know, things are jumping and things are coming back down. It was 2022, 2023 were weird years for pricing things. Like even, for example, the tandem truck that we had come in. And it was just like how you can't predict some of the things. So I'd like to say four years ago, you found those numbers used to be a little on the high side, but it's good to have that sort of buffer. But now they're actually seem to be a little closer. Um, but we'll just you know see what happens in 2024 it's one of those you don't know where the industries are going unfortunately i wish i had a crystal ball <laughs> thank you any other questions i am seeing none okay taylor thank you very much for your presentation i greatly appreciate that we a little more insight into our roles entertain a motion to receive we receive the presentation do i have a seconder for that motion Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. Any conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? Oh, Excuse sorry. I don't know. I don't want to step out of turn, but I just need you to adopt this study just for the asset yes. management okay. plan as well. Thank just to... that's the time. Sorry. Just... Thank you very much, Evan. <laughs> Can that be part of your yes. motion to adopt that study as circulated? Okay. And you're okay with that as a seconder? Absolutely. Okay. So now I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Thank you, Evans. Thank you very much, Dale. Thank you, Mary Council, for your time. Good catch. Good okay. Read. okay. Now we will go to item 10.3 of our agenda, which is Nisha Franta, and the, she is the senior associate, and Michael Tosher, which is a partner for Think Design. I'm sorry if I brutalized your names, but please. That's <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, yeah, this is Misha Franta. I'm uh, landscape architect with Think Design. I'm, I'm alone today. Mike um, uh, had a conflict, but uh, I will take you through this presentation um, on the, the amphitheater concept at Lakehurst Hall. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Yeah, here's the agenda. Um, so we'll just go through this quickly. The purpose of the, I'll take the, purpose of the presentation, um, quick brief project overview. Um, project timeline with some existing conditions photos, um, the amphitheater concept itself with some precedence and cost estimate, 
um, and then considerations uh, you know during construction finally next steps next slide please so obviously the purpose of the presentation is to provide an update to council on the progress um, of work to date that's been completed um, and present the amphitheater concept based on the the um, input we've had with the Lakers Hall board and discussions, um, and then finally receive uh, council's feedback on the concept. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, the project looks to implement in an armor stone amphitheater um, into the existing slope um, behind the um, uh, parking lot at the uh, Lakers Hall. Um, so on the left of the the image, there you see um, the the hall itself, the parking, the existing parking lot, and then slope down to sort of where the amphitheater site is, um, and the trailhead that would be proposed at the um, wood lot to the south of that. Um, next slide, please. So we've uh, project timeline. We've um, done some background review and site analysis met with the the board. Um, so we've provided some preliminary design concepts with the board for review. Um, they've provided some feedback, um, which then led to the refinement of the design concept, um, which we're going to present to you today. Um, Following today's presentation, uh, we'll, we'll refine it further based on any comments um, and based on approval, we'll proceed with uh, contract documents um, between now and April um, with tendering the project slated for spring and then construction and summer, fall. Next slide, please. So just quickly, some existing conditions. Um, right, we're basically at, standing at the, the uh, south end of the parking lot here, overlooking the slope down. Um, there is some um, erosion issues with at the top of the slope and the granular sort of next to the, at the edge of the uh, asphalt paving. Um, and then there's you know a bunch of vegetation on the slope itself. Uh, next slide. Uh, there's sort of an informal um, ATV access point uh, in sort of what would be the middle of um, the area we're talking about. Um, you can also see some erosion in there too. Next slide, please. Um, so on the left, you'd see that's sort of the open clearing where um, uh, at the bottom of the slope, basically, and then on the right, uh, that sort of trail access point at the south woodlot. Next slide, please. So this is the overall uh, concept that we've um, built up to. Um, so if you go to the next slide, sort of zooms in. Um, right, so on the left, you see the building, the Lakers Hall building, um, parking lot. Um, there's a septic field south of the building. Uh, this sort of two dashed lines um, uh, show this top and bottom of the existing slope. Um, and then as mentioned, there's sort of two things going on here. There's, there's the amphitheater itself and then the connection to the proposed trailhead. Um, so that connection is a granular pathway leading down from Lakehurst Circle Road on the east side of the property. Um, there's a proposed sort of gate or um, removable bollard for maintenance access um, that would sort of uh, be a barrier to anything other than pedestrian access. Um, there is a proposed fence on the east side property line um, with some type of hedge or evergreen vegetation um, in front of it. Um, the amphitheater, I guess what was requested was a, a three-tiered circular 
um, Armourstone Amphitheater um, with access from the hall to the bottom of it. So uh, there is the three tiers with a ramp down at the, that you can see leading from the hall at the top um, that would lead to a sort of fourth um, half tier that would be an accessible tier for um, accessible seating or wheelchair seating. And then the ramp would sort of continue down the west side of it um, to the bottom of the, the amphitheater. Of course, there's a stage or platform. Um, and then an additional row of armor stone at the top, um, at the edge of the parking lot, sort of as a barrier from the parking lot um, that would also act as some erosion control um, and curb stops in front of that to, you know, so that people don't um, hit the barrier. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here you can see it in section beginning on the left, um, there's that armor stone sort of wall barrier at the edge of the parking lot, um, sloping down um, some um, slope stabilization vegetation between in the gap between the um, amphitheater and the and the parking lot. Um, roughly 1.5 meters between um, each tier, or that's sort of the width between the armor stone tiers, um, stepping down towards the stage or platform. Uh, next slide, please. So just a couple, of, I'm sure you're all familiar with armor stone um, <clears throat> on the right. <coughs> it can be cut in um, different ways. Um, the the image on the left kind of gives you an idea of what a uh, sort of granular and armor stone circular um, amphitheater might look like um, leading to a platform or, or stage. <coughs> Sorry, next slide, please. So rough costing, it's uh, broken down into um, removals, and site preparation, um, surfacing and planting, and then site furnishings, which is mainly the armor stone um, uh, stage or platform, sort of trailhead sign, gate, um, curb stops, wood fence. And that um, all comes out to about 185K. Um, next slide, please. So some key considerations during uh, construction is that a, a comprehensive survey has not been prepared for this. So, so some design adjustments might uh, be required during construction. Um, grading in the concept that was shown is, is based on uh, some spot elevations that were taken on site, uh, just to understand what the grading was like. Uh, but grading and earthworks will need to be sort of refined in cooperation with the contractor and to some degree to the, to the discretion of the contractor and the conditions on site. Um, and the neighboring property to the east uh, has built some structures elements on Lake Hall property. So the owner will be advised um, to remove prior to construction. Next slide. So the next steps um, would be to refine the concept based on um, any um, comments today, um, and then head into um, contract documents between now and um, Feb or April of this year um, with tendering of the project in, in um, the spring and construction following summer, fall of this year. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, if, if any questions or discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Misha. Good, great presentation. Anyone have any questions? I see no questions. Okay, see, Councillor Pranley, go ahead. Um, I, I, on your concept, uh, would the stage have a roof uh, as the building that was uh, uh, shown in, in the slides? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Would the stage have a roof as you showed in your slides? 
your example? Um, it, it could that that uh, we did not budget for that in the um, okay. in the cost estimate, uh, but that could also, you know, of course, be phased in if um, if it didn't meet the budget on the first round. Um, okay. But it could be it could be um, prepared for if that was of interest. Okay, thank you. I think Councillor Brewer got a question. Yeah, through you, Mayor, uh, to Councillor Franz, and uh, that is the intent is yeah. to is to mimic that so what was in the yeah. picture there and have it covered. And mm -hmm. and I think Dylan will be able to speak to that. Uh, Any other questions? I think this is a kind of a neat project for the Galloway yeah. or for the Lakers Hall area and show some connectivity. So do some active transportation and we just talked about that maybe when Lakers Road gets rehabilitated we can do some active transportation on one way kind of all connects together okay no questions any staff have any questions I'm seeing none you said you must have did a really good job on your presentation because no one has any more <laughs> I thank you very much thank you okay. and be prepared to make a motion to proceed that Councillor Brandon, do I have a seconder? Councillor Braybrook for a seconder. Any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Thank you very much. We can now even move on to item 10.4 of our agenda, which is Sean Michael Steffen, Managing Partner for Watson and Associates. Can you please unmute yourself and you have the floor. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, on the next slide, uh, just to, in terms of the, uh, the purpose of the meeting today is to provide an update on the, the municipalities development charge background study uh, that's been prepared in advance of the expiry of the current bylaw uh, on April 16th of this year. And so the, the draft study has been released on the municipality's website on February 2nd, uh, and the intent today is to give council an overview of the background study prior to the uh, statutory public meeting uh, that's scheduled later in the process um, to give council a more in-depth uh, overview of the background study and the, the bylaw policies. So on the next slide, please. And one more again, just to, to review the inputs into the background study. Firstly, with respect to the growth forecast, uh, a growth forecast has been prepared for the next 10 year period uh, based primarily on the county's uh, recently adopted official plan. And looking at the anticipated growth from a residential non residential standpoint to inform what the anticipated capital needs are. Uh, or, or to facilitate that new development, continue to provide services within the municipality uh, for new development. And so over that 10 year period, it's anticipated to be a, a net increase in population of about 375 persons, including both the uh, permanent and seasonal population. And that would be accommodated about 220 new residential dwelling units. And on the non-residential side, the county's official plan identifies fairly strong employment growth about 170 new jobs created over that period that would produce about 17,000 square meters of gross floor area development. So on the, the next slide then, looking at the, based on that anticipated growth, what the increase in need for service would be, oh, one slide again, please. Uh, we looked at the four service areas as allowed under the development charges, or four service areas that are allowed under the Development Charges Act. That, being services related to a highway, being roads and related infrastructure, as well as public works, vehicles and equipment, fire protection services, parks and recreation services, library services. There are additional uh, services that are eligible under the Development Charges Act, but these are the four that were identified as having a potential growth related capital needs within the municipality. Next slide, please. So across those four service areas, then the, the total gross capital costs have been identified to provide service uh, to new, new development over that period 
total about $44 million. And then we can see of those gross capital costs, how they break down by, um, by the various deductions that have to be made and the capital costs can be included in the calculation of the charge. And so under the Development Charges Act, there are certain deductions we need to make from the capital costs, the most significant one being if there is a benefit to existing development of the capital needs that are being identified. And as you can see in the yellow section of the pie chart, that's the greatest share of these costs that has been identified, being about 90% of the cost or $40 million is actually a benefit to existing development and not costs that would be recovered through your development charge bylaw. And so this $40 million relates largely to the benefit to existing share of the public works and fire a facility redevelopment plan, uh, as well as the the existing share of uh, future road improvements that have been included, uh, as well as um, fleet replacement, and, and also uh, about $6 million of that is related to the benefit to existing share of the future or the, the future needs identified in the open space master plan that have been considered for partial recovery through the development charge bylaw. <clears throat> You also notice in the, the top right dark blue section is what we call a post period benefit being costs that are growth related, but that would be of a benefit to growth beyond the 10 year forecast period so they wouldn't be recovered from development charges to this bylaw but could be included in a subsequent bylaw. And then there's just under $800,000 or 2% of the costs are reflect are deducted reflecting existing development charge reserve funds that the municipality has already collected and can be counted against the future needs and don't need, need to obviously be um, collected again from future development. So that results in about 6% of the cost being uh, recoverable from development charges, about $1.7, $1.8 million from residential development and about 730,000 from non-residential development. On the following slide then, looking at how those uh, growth related costs break down by uh, service area of the, of the total $2.5 million, but 1.7 million is related to the services related to a highway. And those costs are primarily the growth related share of the new Depot 49. Um, when looking at fire protection services, representing about 25% of the growth related costs or about $610,000. Those costs are a mix of the growth related portion of the new fire public works facilities that are anticipated, uh, as well as uh, other um, shares of future vehicle and equipment needs. Uh, with respect to parks and recreation services, the needs have been identified um, there represent 6% of the total cost, and again, primarily related to the open space master plan uh, forecast needs. And for library services, a fairly small share, about $13,000 has been identified, which is a provision to account for maintaining the uh, library collection items for future growth, as well as um, future facility space needs for new development. Um, so on the, the next slide then, looking at the development charge calculation, one more slide again, please. The charge, the structure of the charge has been maintained in a similar fashion for the most part to the existing charge uh, that the municipality imposes. And so the, the charge is imposed by residential dwelling unit as well as per square meter of non-residential gross floor area. There's also a, a charge per 500 kilowatts of nameplate generating capacity for green energy development. But with respect to the residential charge per dwelling unit, the current charge is imposed for single and semi-attached dwelling units, row houses, and then one category for apartments. What's proposed as you can see here for the residential dwelling unit types is that the apartment category be broken out between two bedroom and greater and one bedroom and bachelor apartments, uh, consistent with the uh, industry best practices in, in DC studies and bylaws across uh, the province. Also noting here that uh, in your current bylaw, park model trailers are charged as apartment units, uh, being the lowest development charge <laughs> that, is, um, that is imposed. Um, with this change to the apartment unit structure, 
of park model trailers would continue to be charged as apartments, but at, at the one bedroom and bachelor apartment rate. And then that charge also would not include the parks and recreation component of the charge. On the next slide, then we can see the, the schedule of charges that has been calculated. And so um, the, the charge for a single and semi-attached dwelling unit being the vast majority of the anticipated dwelling units that would be constructed in the municipality would be $7,584 per dwelling unit. Um, those charges um, are, you can see how they was break down by service area about $5,100 for services related to a highway, $1,820 for fire protection services, and about $580 for parks and recreation, and $55 for library. Um, those charges then decrease by dwelling unit based on the uh, assumed occupancy assumptions of those dwelling units from census data. And then the charge per square meter of gross floor area is just under $43. On the next slide, then, looking at how those charges compare to the current charges that are imposed, mm -hmm. um, we can see that the fully calculated charge for a single semi-attached dwelling unit would increase by about uh, $1,800 over the current charge of $5,749, or about a 32% increase. Uh, what should also be highlighted, though, is that um, with the changes to the Development Charges Act under Bill 23, uh, any new bylaws um, can only be or have to be phased in over the first five years of the bylaw. And during the first year of the bylaw, only 80% of the full charge can be imposed. And so although the full charge is calculated at almost $7,600, the charge that would actually be imposed during the first year of the bylaw is $6,067 or only a 6% increase over the current charges that are in place in the municipality. Um, and then looking at the non-residential charges per square meter, we can see that the um, charge would be $43 um, or $35 in the first year of the bylaw, um, which would roughly double the current charge. And just to note that the that current charge that is imposed was not the fully calculated charge in the 2019 background study. Um, the fully calculated charge is the charge that you're currently imposing on, on only on aggregate developments, which is $63 uh, per square meter. The lower charge for any non-aggregate non-residential developments was imposed uh, through policy by council to impose a lower rate for other non-residential developments. Um, but what is being proposed is that for all non-residential development, aggregate or otherwise, is that the fully calculated charge would be imposed which in the first year of the bylaw would be $34.36 per square meter. On the next slide, uh, we can see how those charges then compare to neighboring municipalities. And so what's presented here is the, I think maybe the legend looks like it might be cut off a little bit on the screen, um, but in the dark blue section are the uh, lower tier municipal development charges. The yellow section are upper tier municipal development charges to so the county of Peterborough in your case. And then the green section are where we do have education development charges applicable um, to give the sort of the full spect spectrum of what the development charges are that are payable in the different municipalities. And so what we can see is that um, your current charges, including the county, place you uh, sort of in that mid range of the comparison. And with the 6% increase or just over a $300 increase to that charge in year one, that would move you slightly above Selwyn, um, but still lower than a number of the other uh, neighboring municipalities. And even at the fully calculated charge, uh, which would come into place in year five of the bylaw, that would move you just slightly ahead of Duro Drummer. So generally maintaining that same relative position to other municipalities in terms of that development charge policy. On the next slide, looking at the same illustration, but for commercial development on a per square meter basis, we can see obviously with the um, doubling of the, uh, the municipality's charge, that would move you slightly further up in the comparison um, from sort of that lower mid range uh, above Aspidal Norwood, but below Port Hope and Selwyn um, to a range fairly similar to what's imposed in 
Hamilton Township, but lower than Autonomy South Monaghan uh, and the, um, the existing urban service area within Coburg. And lastly, on the following slide, looking at uh, again similar comparison, but for industrial, uh, the county does exempt industrial development, so we don't see that section of the yellow uh, the yellow bar within this comparison. And so, with the the doubling of the uh, municipalities' charges, we've seen year one moving above um, a few of the other municipalities that are at that lower end into that range. Um, just below that of Center Hastings, Cramay, and Sterling Rodham. So still maintaining a, a relatively competitive position in the range of that comparison. Uh, next slide, please. And one more again after that. So then to look at the development charge bylaw policies that govern the implementation of the charge, uh, the development charges are calculated and collected at building permit issuance. That will continue under the new bylaw with the exception that any developments that proceed through site plan or zoning bylaw amendment will have their charges determined on the day that application is made. And then they're held frozen at that rate uh, for a maximum of two years after the approval of that application. So allowing for some greater cost certainty for uh, applicants by having that, those charges calculated earlier in the development approvals process. Then as well for any uh, rental housing institutional developments as defined in the act, they are actually required to have the charges payable in six equal annual installments commencing with the date of occupancy. The act allows for interest to be charged on uh, these installment payments as well as the charges frozen at planning application submission. And that would be imposed at the maximum interest rate of that's determined under the act, which is the uh, average uh, prime rate plus 1%. Um, as well to note the, the one other exception at council's discretion to the timing of collection is that through an agreement under section 27 of the act, um, council can agree with an applicant to have their charges paid before or after the otherwise would be payable. So you have the ability to enter into early or late payment agreements. On the next slide then looking at the exemptions to the payment of development charges. There are certain types of development and uses that are defined in the act as being exempt that the municipality must witness, but the act also allows municipalities to, or requires municipalities, I should say, to have rules in the bylaw to determine when the charges would be imposed, um, what exemptions and phases and discounts there also might be, so requiring those to be defined in the bylaw. Uh, those are usually defined based on the use, geographic area, development type, uh, specific services, for example, that might be exempt. Uh, what the Act is fairly clear in, though, just to make sure Council is fully aware, is that when you do exempt uh, the payment of development charges, whether as required under the Act or um, through an exemption that Council has elected to have in their bylaw, that is a loss in revenue that the municipality needs to make up and can't be passed on to future forms of development. On the next slide then, um, looking at um, quickly through the, the statutory exemptions that are in place, you don't impose development charges on yourselves, um, the, the county or school boards, lands intended for use by university are also exempt. Any existing industrial buildings can expand by up to 50% of their existing floor area without the payment of development charges. And then there are additional residential unit exemptions in, uh, in existing and new residential buildings as well, where you can add two apartment units uh, within or ancillary to a single detached, semi-detached or row house. And only one of those units can be ancillary to get that exemption. On the following slide, um, nonprofit housing is also exempt, which was added through Bill 23. Uh, inclusionary zoning affordable housing units are exempt, also added through Bill 23. And there are additional exemptions for affordable and attainable units that are included in the Act, but aren't yet in, in force until they're proclaimed by the Lieutenant Governor. And one of the things that we're waiting on from the province is to release a bulletin that will further define and establish how the affordability criteria 
uh, will be established. But once, once that uh, does occur, those exemptions that would also be in place. There are also discounts for rental housing development uh, by bedroom number between 15 and 25% discounts to the charges that are payable. And as I highlighted earlier, there are, is a mandatory reduction um, of the DC during the first five years of the bylaw, where in year one of the bylaw, only 80% can be imposed up to 100% in the fifth year of the bylaw with bylaws having a maximum life of 10 years, but it can be um, revisited or amended at any time before that. Uh, on the next slide, then the, the non-statutory exemptions that the council currently has in your bylaw include farm buildings, hospitals, uh, places of worship, uh, smaller um, wind turbine systems or uh, solar generating installations or new non-residential buildings. The first 250 square meters of gross floor areas developed or is uh, exempt. Accessory uses are also exempt as well as affordable housing. Uh, county currently, or I say that Ms. Bay currently has a, an exemption for those uses and um, they can also waive the charge for a related nonprofit agency. And so those exemptions that are currently in your bylaw are proposed to be maintained. On the next slide, is to highlight the redevelopment credits that are in your bylaw. So they're in place for conversions or demolitions of existing uses. Uh, the intent of the redevelopment credits is that where someone is replacing a structure uh, that already existed, there is no increase in need for service, if for service with respect to replacing that existing building. Um, however, the redevelopment must occur within five years of demolition of the existing building. And the reason for the, the five-year term is that um, it's one well, generally consistent with uh, municipal practice across the province, and it recognizes that once a building is demolished, at some point through your um, through your growth forecasting work and your master planning work and, and other needs assessment, that the fact that building no longer exists, any capacity in the system is really being reallocated to other uses. So it, at some point that capacity is no longer maintained for that, that use or that building that was demolished and is no longer part of the, the existing housing stock. Um, and so the so the credits are available. So if you demolish a single family home and replace it with a new one, the DCs offset each other. Um, the, the credits are not available though if the, the prior use would be exempt under the bylaw. And as well to note um, for park model trailers that were um, created after April 16, 2019, being the date of your last bylaw, um, if they are um, replaced, uh, there is no credit available for those if they didn't pay development charges when they should have. So just a, a policy to highlight that if the development charge policy was not appropriately applied to new units created after the last bylaw, that they would not be eligible for credits. Uh, and then lastly, with um, indexing, so from the last couple slides here, nor over slightly over time, the bylaw will continue to be indexed on a mandatory basis. Uh, in accordance with the act uh, to allow the charge to keep pace with the um, the changes in the underlying cost of infrastructure. Uh, currently, the indexing occurs on January 1st of each year. What's proposed is that the indexing date would be moved to April 2nd, uh, being the date that the new bylaw would come into force, so that, and which is also the date that the phase in of the bylaw has to change each year. So then allowing for some additional administrative ease of only having one change to the charge each year. So on April 2nd, that's the date that the phase in would change as well as the indexing of your bylaw. Um, then going ahead to slides just on the next steps in the process. Um, so um, subsequent to this meeting, uh, municipality and staff receive feedback from council. Uh, we prepare an addendum to the study if any are required. The public meeting as required in the act has been scheduled for March 5th um, and the municipality will give the appropriate notice of that meeting as required under the act. And then after that meeting, the bylaw will be coming back to council for approval at your April 2nd meeting, meeting the 60 day requirement um, after the release of the study uh, on the 2nd of February. Uh, that does conclude my presentation. I am available if there are any questions or discussion items.
Okay, thank you very much. We will have any questions. Any council members have a question? Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Sorry, I think I saw Councilor Cadigan. Be happy to defer. Okay. My question, Councilor Cadigan. For you, Mayor Lamb said, my question is regarding the discount for rental units. Uh, are short-term rentals also eligible for the 25% discount? Uh, it would depend on the uh, on the type of unit. So rental housing development is defined in the act and it's defined as a building with at least four residential units that are all intended for um, rented residential purposes. So a, a you, um, someone utilizing a single family home or a, a unit in a secondary unit in their home for short term rentals would not meet that definition. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I'm to be yeah, thanks very much. There's an awful lot to digest in here. So thank you for it, I think. Um, two questions. The first one, if we could go back to, I think it's page seven of your presentation. Is that the pie chart? Uh, no, so maybe I had it wrong. It was where it broke down. Um, not seven. Uh, it's where you indicated, I guess we could look at page nine. You've created two categories of apartments, which I think is new. Mm -hmm. not the next page nine, page. yes. There we go, thank you. So we've created two categories of apartments based on, I think you said best practices. My question is on the, and we have very few of those. Um, mm -hmm. 90 some percent of our residences will fall under the single and semi-detached dwelling units. Yeah. And there's only one category of that. And that category is experiencing a very high percentage increase if you look at the full five years. So my question is, are there other um, jurisdictions which break that category into subcategories? For example, somebody building a 10,000 square foot house versus somebody building a 1,500 square cottage. Clearly, their footprint and their investment and everything else is very, very, very different. So are there examples of other municipalities who do break that category down uh, into more than the one? That's the question. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, um, so there are, I'm aware of one, um, I'm not aware of many others, that there might be a handful in the province that break down single and semi-attached into subcategories. Um, and where they they do that, it's not based on size of the of the a building from a, a gross floor area standpoint. It's based on bedroom number, and and the reason being that the the development charges methodology. It's not um, residential buildings that is driving the need for service. It's population, mm -hmm. and so um, the the number of bedrooms in a um, so in a in, in a home and is a better indication of the occupancy than the size of the home itself. And, and that bears out in, in census data when looking at the occupancy of newly constructed dwellings, larger single and semi-attached um, dwellings, just purely from a, a footprint, not a bedroom standpoint, don't have a greater occupancy than a smaller dwelling of a, a similar bedroom number. Um, and, and so you could, you could break that charge out by number of bedroom units for single and semi-detached. Um, the, the difficulty in doing so is having sufficient data to look at you know, where we're going to make that, that break off point. So some look at three, um, sorry, up to three bedrooms as one category of home and then less greater than three bedrooms uh, as another. Um, there may not be sufficient 
data in for a municipality of your size in, in census data to, to really give meaningful data set to make that differentiation. Okay, uh, thank you for that. I think one of the next steps is for staff to provide feedback. So perhaps that's something that in their feedback they could consider uh, as the applicability in our municipality. Um, the second question, and I'll get the page wrong again, um, but you said something about aggregate operations when you were talking about industrial um, class of service. Could you repeat what you said? Because I did not catch it. I think you said it was a separate, it was a unique charge, and now it's going to be the same as other in industrial. But could you just go through that again, please? Sure. So if you go to, if you go ahead a couple slides, um, only one slide actually. Um, third back one slide. I think it's there, but it's it's further down on the slide. You can raise the slide up a little. Bit. Right, here, here would be good. So, um, so see on the on the right hand call right, the two right hand columns of the schedule of charges. We have the, the green energy development in the far right, and then we have all other non-residential development is being included as one category on a per square meter basis. Uh, in your current bylaw, that, um, that per square meter of gross floor area is actually broken down between one charge for aggregate development and one charge for all other non-residential developments. And so the um, the current charge for aggregate development is about $60 per square meter. And that was the fully calculated charge in your prior background study. Um, the charge for all other non-residential developments is currently about $17 per square meter. And, and what I was highlighting was that that differentiation, those charges was not driven by a, a different demand for service for aggregate development versus non-aggregate development. It was, it was a council decision through policy to impose a lower charge for, um, for non-aggregate development in the, in the 2019 bylaw. And I think some of the rationale was around the wear and tear. I mean, we've got over 30 quarries or pits in our municipality. And I think the thinking behind that was that there's greater uh, deterioration of our roads just because of the transport uh, of the aggregate materials to market. And that's why it was a higher rate. So I think if, again, staff is providing feedback on this, I think that's an area that I would also like to see highlighted because I think there was some sound rationale for charging a higher rate for aggregate operations than for other industrial operations. Okay, any other questions? Go ahead, Councilor Brown. Follow-up question to Deputy yeah. Mayor. Uh, would the non-aggregate, uh, uh, that include uh, uh, farming operations? It, it uh, would, but there, uh, there's a policy that those would be exempt. Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead, Councilor Braver. Thank you, through your Mayor. I have my question clear, and then listening to uh, <laughs> Deputy Mayor Armstrong's questions, yeah, I'm sort of confusing myself, but uh, I'll try to. Uh, no, that's okay. Uh, Mr. Stephen, uh, the so this uh, I'm referencing your DC comparison, uh, the residential single detached comparison chart. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, where where it's uh, what I'm looking at is uh, the the municipal wide services slash classes, and you have the five listed and the far right column the change of percentage. Now back to where it says current uh, versus calculated 2024. Um, so the current this the last uh, I guess. The last study that was done was back in 2019, is that correct? And, and this one uh, that you're presenting today is, is going to be the new one, is that correct? Uh, yes, the, the last comprehensive study was in 2019. There was an update study done in 2021-2022 to amend that charge. Okay, and I'm just looking at, I'm just trying to compare uh, where it says current and calculated. I'm interested in, in what was previous. 
um, the previous year to two years to three years uh, before that. Uh, I just wanted to get a context on on the increases and that sort of thing. Um, so that was just more for me. Is that available at all? Or? So in terms of what's driving the increase for the different uh, services? Yeah, well, what's driving it and which would result in uh, an increase or a decrease over the years? Sure. So the 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 change. Oh, I'll give a little bit of background. I'll just answer some of your question. The 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 current charge that's in place right now. So that would have changed since the 2019 bylaw based on the indexing of that charge every year, as well as the in 2022 the amendment to the charge. Um, that went into place uh, to affect some, to reflect some of the legislative changes that had occurred. Um, so then in updating the charge now, so the, the calculated charge, what we've looked at is, uh, again, looking at the anticipated development, the capital needs for that development, um, what is the required charge to recover those costs? And so largely what's driving that is, um, is updated cost estimates compared to what was prepared previously, which have increased at a greater rate than inflation, right? As well as um, the municipality moving through uh, into greater detail, the facility redevelopment plan, which is really in its early stages in 2019. Um, and there were some provisions included in that respect, but um, very little from a, a fire protection standpoint because not a lot had been sort of teased out at that point in terms of what the, the plan was for the redevelopment of those public works and fire protection facilities. And then the other, other item just to highlight, I'm not sure if I did mention it, is you'll, you'll notice administration studies as being in, in the current charge but not in the calculated. That's because studies were removed as an eligible cost on the act in Bill 23. So, once the new bylaw is passed, the cost of growth-related studies can no longer be recovered from development charges, so that's not included in the updated charge. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much, Mr. Steve. Just one more question. Uh, same chart uh, where you'd mentioned that 80% of the charge, which uh, is currently $6,067, and that'll increase 5% per year uh, thereafter until the full amount of 7584 is uh, reached, is that correct? Uh, until the seven, full amount of five, seven, yeah, 7,584 is reached. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other question? I'm seeing none. Is anyone prepared to make a motion? Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. I believe at this point in time, it's just a motion to receive the gift Do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Cadigan is the seconder. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, greatly appreciate it. Mr. Mayor, very well. we have the fire report. We absolutely can. We're going to take a five minute, 10 minute, five minute, five minute break. Okay, we are back. We can move on now to item 11 of our agenda, which is delegations, and we have none. So we will move on to item 12 of our agenda, which is staff reports. We can go to 12.1, public works, and 12.1.1 is Evan Grieger, our director of public works. Could you please speak to this item? Thank you, Mayor Lamsad. Through you, Mayor Lamsad, to members of council before you today is a report regarding the Deer Bay Reach Road South Road Allowance Transfer. Um, if you can see in the key map with is the attachment there, we're just looking to uh, begin the process and get the blessing of council to um, complete the transfer of the section of road. Um, the section of road, when you look at it, appears that it was originally part of a plan of subdivision, um, I believe back in the 80s. And uh, typically, once the houses are built, you would have assumed the road, there would have been a process back in that time. Unfortunately, it never was officially transferred. Um, because it's in the GIS, it's easy to identify. Um, we've been providing maintenance on the section of road, including grading and snow plowing for an extended amount of time. Um, and this process would just sort of include this road allowance into our road network. Um, there's multiple other areas where there's sort of like this, where there just hasn't been cleaned up. Um, and just to note, there was a request from the association that we would fully cover the cost of the surveys. 
Um, we in the past, we sort of shared those survey costs. So that's sort of the reasoning why staff recommended. Obviously as council, you can direct either way, but that's uh, that was just a little, little add on. I just wanted to have a bit of the cost of the survey that it was requested that we cover the full cost. However, um, in any other processes, you would typically split the cost. So that's why I'm recommending to share the cost. Thank you very much. Okay, does anyone have any questions of Evan? Go ahead, Councilor Sir, Sir. Through you, Mary. Uh, thanks, Evan. Um, so when you're talking about in this uh, the recommendation, the coordinator survey, now what were you saying, who, who's gonna uh, bear that cost? So that's that's where this the survey cost would be split between the municipality and the road association, okay. and that's where the yeah we would the municipality would go coordinate the survey, get the survey completed and everything, and we would share that cost with um, with the road association. The survey cost would be um, done through our purchasing process purchasing policy process, so that would be obtaining three quotes to ensure that we're getting the best value for what we're, the work that we're doing. Okay, go so ahead. Just the uh, last one. Now, will that come back to council as far as how much that would be our share, or d it, does it have to? Or um, thank you, Councilor Braver, through you, Mayor Lambset. Um, typically, um, if the cost is something that we can work with in our budget, then we wouldn't necessarily take a half to take it back to the council. Um, I honestly, I'm not 100 percent sure on what the, the cost is going to come back. I'm hoping it is fairly reasonable probably hopefully under ten thousand dollars or something like that and that would be within the purchasing policy where i can approve as a department head sort of thing okay and, and that would be sort of three and yeah. that would be ten thousand and shared so yeah okay okay thank you okay any other questions i'm seeing none is anyone prepared to make a motion Go ahead, Councillor Brave. Uh, make a motion to uh, receive the report and uh, that uh, council direct staff to coordinate a survey and complete the process to assume that reference section of the array we trope said. Shared cost. Do we need to put in for you, Mayor? Do we need to include in the motion that we're sharing costs? Yes. Sure. Did you want me to do a county amendment as well? Or mm -hmm. do you want me to do a amendment? You can, if you were okay with that amendment. Yes, I'm, I'm okay. Yes. I'm sorry. And you were seconding it? Yes. Okay. Councilor Pat, yes. Okay. Very good. You got the motion? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. <clears throat> okay. We can move. Thank you very much, Evan Greer. We can move on to item 12.2 of our agenda, which is recreation facilities. In 12.2.1, Dylan Kosher, Director of Recreation Facilities, would like to speak to this item, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, before you have a report regarding um, the Lakehurst Amphitheater or Lower Bowl project, as we have called it in this report, um, presented to you earlier today by Think Design. Um, so now you've seen the um, uh, the concept as requested by council and a budget breakdown of um, the cost of the project. Um, to follow up a bit on the um, comment um, or question story regarding the uh, covered structure. So we did um, have the discussions um, uh, in our preliminary meetings that um, we would like to have a covered structure there, um, but feeling that the covered structure likely wouldn't fit within the $200,000 parameter set out by council um, for an annual budget. Um, so we would look to phase that project in. And so we, in designing this, and when we get to construction, um, we would have specification that would allow for us to add a covered structure down the road. That also is the advantage of including that maintenance um, pathway. One, it's it's maintenance for the trail and the site itself, but it also will allow access for um, a future builder to get in there and um, build us a structure. Um, so as you saw, the, the estimated budget is approximately $185,000, um, not including or tax or any contingency. Council did set an annual budget for open spaces um, for $200,000. So we fit within that. I'm recommending we stick with that $200,000. So we do have that little um, contingency as, as everyone knows, things come up during the build process that uh, we can't always plan for. Um, 
I think um, the general feeling that the Hall Board is that they feel included on this project and they're very excited to see it move forward. Um, I hope Councillor Braybrook um, also feels the same way with that. Um, so just to tie up loose ends um, here to, to kind of get that formal approval to move forward with this, um, with this project, um, to direct staff to research and apply for applicable grants, which um, our economic development coordinator and I have already been speaking and looking at, and as well to direct staff to investigate um, potential cost savings and alternate funding sources, um, things like grubbing the site, maybe things that can be done in-house by staff, um, as well as um, potentially finding some other funding sources, be it donations or, or um, specific procurement practices within our purchasing policy that would maybe allow us to um, get more bang for your buck, so to speak. Okay, does anyone have any questions of Bill? Let's see, Councillor Francis, go ahead. Uh, I have one question, if, if through the mayor, if we would uh, find somebody that would donate uh, a large portion of the stone for this project, could we then include the roof? Through you, Mayor. Um, that would be a lovely addition. Um, that would be kind of the goal is that um, any cost savings that we are um, able to see is that we would, you know, that, that money that we saved on the front end of the stone, so, per se, could then be put towards another project um, such as the roof um, for this site and you know that will you know obviously there's engineering and architectural that goes into that and procurement process you know if we get to uh, i can't remember this timeline exactly but may or june and where the tenders approved by the time we get architectural engineering done we may not be able to actually see a structure in 2024 but that money would still be there available that we could pull back out in 25 and, and complete that end Okay, any other questions? Go ahead, Councillor Braver. Through you, Mayor, just a comment uh, from the Lakers Hall Board, and, and I'll bring my information item forward to this, because it's related to this uh, motion. Um, Lakers Hall Board just wanted to thank uh, the staff, Dylan, and, and also Council for, for the support of, of this project. And, and I've uh, received a lot of feedback from uh, not only the hall board members, but uh, a lot of the uh, residents in the area. They're pretty excited about this uh, this project. Yeah. Is there any other yeah. comments or questions? I just have one. I, I, I had a dream last night that you had a program to donate a stone. And if you do that, I'll donate one. <laughs> <laughs> Through your, yourself, Mayor, that's uh, that's a very creative idea, and we'll uh, that that's certainly something that we're looking to explore. We're staff are open to ideas to make this uh, happen at the uh, at the best way possible. I think it's a, a nice contact connectivity to the trail too. I think that's all part and parcel. I think it's something that will be well used in the Lakers area by anyone in Trent Lakes. Thank you very much, Dylan. Any other comments? Seeing none, is anyone prepared to make a motion? Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Uh, motion with a comment, if I may, uh, or I'll wait until seconded, whichever. Um, the council received a report that we approve the lower uh, bowl project at Lakers Hall, that we direct staff to research and apply for applicable grants, and further that council direct staff to investigate potential cost savings or alternate funding or in kind sources. Do I have a second to hear that motion? Councillor Braybrook, and I think you had a comment. I do, just that. Uh, I think this is a terrific project. It aligns with our strategic plan. It aligns with our open spaces plan. Um, it will be something concrete that the public can see. Uh, we've made forward uh, progress in implementing both of those. Um, and finally, I like the idea that it was sort of a grassroots idea that came forward to the council. Um, and I'll save the last comment for later. Well, that's all. Okay, thank you very much for your comment. Any other comments or conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Thank you very much for that motion, Deputy Mayor. Okay, we can move on to item 12.3, which is fire and emergency service. We have none. We can move on to 12.4, building and planning, and 12.4.1. Barbara Waldron, our director of public. Building and Planning and CBO. 
Would you like to speak to this item? Good afternoon, through you, Mayor Lanshead. The first report is just a very simple update on the TAC committee to the council. I know that uh, the mayor and the deputy mayor do get a little few, a um, little bit more information at county council. So the purpose of this report is so that all of council understands where we're at with the official plan. We have reconvened the TAC committee um, in light of the new provincial policy statement that is going to be coming down. And we are just wanting to have our documents in line with that document. So we're not doing the work twice. So the first meeting uh, was a digital meeting and we just basically got ourselves set back up and set our parameters of what we want to achieve. The second meeting, we actually started digging into the PPS and comparing it to the current document that was sitting before the minister. And we're just going through and checking things and tweaking things and taking things out if they're not working for us. Um, so we do meet again uh, in February and uh, we're gonna try to have two staff there at all time. I think it's important for both Adele and I to be there or possibly the, whoever's gonna be filling the, the junior planner position so that we have two sets of ears at the meetings. And I have just basically copied the minutes so you have the same information that every other municipal has. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you very much for all of us. Anyone have any questions of work? I'm seeing none. I have one little comment. I think the last comment we got from MPP Smith was we're in the queue. In a couple of months from that, but we're in the queue. <laughs> thank you very much. Anyone prepared to make that motion? Please recommend. Mr. Graybrook, a mover. Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. With a comment, if go, I may. Go ahead. Absolutely. Just, I really appreciate you coming forward with this, Barb. I think the last term of council, it was a very hidden thing that was going on. And I think council really didn't understand what work was being done on the official plan. Um, so it's terrific that we have a, a line of sight to it. So thank you. Very Keep nice. it up. And it's, and it's been years in the making. So yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other comments? Let me see. No, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Thank you very much. We can move on to item 12.4.2 of the agenda, which is Barbara Walter, our Director of Public of Building and Planning <coughs> CBO. Can you speak to this item? Three, Mayor Lamson. So this uh, report is in connection with two complete applications that have been made by uh, Mr. Phillips and Mr. and Mrs. Powell. They have um, asked for us to move forward with um, implementing a licensing agreement with them. They have provided me with all the documents that are needed. They comply with the policy that's in place at the current time. I did reach out to them yesterday in light of some emails that were coming in over the weekend just to confirm that they did want to move forward with these applications. They both advised me that they were very aware of what was taking place on the weekend. Um, through conversations that they had received and they still wish to go forward. They feel that they have all their information in place. They understand licensing is, sorry, the um, license of occupation is, is a bylaw that's, or sorry, policy that's in place and they want to be in compliance. Okay, thank you very much, Barbara. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Seeing none, is anyone prepared to make a motion? See Councilor Graber. Go ahead. I'd like a motion that Council receive the report and that Council approve the license of occupation agreement as listed, and that Council authorize uh, the Director of Building and Planning to execute any documents that may be necessary to affect the license of occupancy. Do we have a second for that motion? Councilor Cranston for a second. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. Do you have a recorded vote, please? Sure. We can have a recorded vote. Are we ready for the vote? Sure, we are. Deputy Mayor Armstrong, are you in favor? Yes. Councillor Braybrook? Yes. Councillor Cadigan? Yes. Councillor Franzen? Yes. Mayor Lambsford? Yes. That vote is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trevor. Now we can move on to item 12.4.3 of our agenda, which is Adele Arbor, our planner. Would you like to speak to this item, Adele? 
Yes, thank you. And through you, Mayor Lambshead, this is an MAF for the property municipally known as 1561 Salmon Lake Road. Property owners Gregory and Laura Lowry are wanting to create a new lot. This consent application is in conformity to the official plan as all the existing building was authorized by a building permit. However, the buildings are not compliant to the municipality zoning bylaw. Municipal planning staff are in support of the consent application B-41-23, conditional upon the following recommended conditions. $1,000 cash in lieu of parkland payment to the municipality, a rezoning of both the severed and retained parcels, which will include the submission of an R plan, an agreement be entered into between the applicant and the municipality, which will implement the requirements and recommendations of the natural heritage evaluation. If the reference plan confirms that White Lakes Road is located on the severed lot, as illustrated on the severance sketch portion of the application, the municipality will require that the traveled road having a minimum width of 20 meters measured equidistant from the center line of the traveled road to be transferred as a road dedication to the municipality. An entrance permit shall be obtained for the severed lot and the new entrance shall be constructed in accordance with the entrance permit requirements and approved by the municipality. The retained lot is occupied by a cabin and a camper located within the 30 meter water yard setback. It is recommended that in the zoning bylaw amendment, the cabin be recognized as a guest cabin or a storage building. It is recommended that the severed parcel be rezoned from rural to rural residential and environmental protection. It is recommended that the retained parcel, which is deficient in lot frontage, be rezoned from rural, shoreline residential and environmental protection to shoreline residential and environmental protection with an exception for those buildings that exist. Okay, thank you very much Adele. Does anyone have any questions over there? Go ahead, you, Mary. Thank you, Madam said. Um, and as part of our uh, requirement that the camper be removed? The camper, the can, through you, Mr. Mayor, the camper could be removed from the shoreline, yes. Great, thank you. <clears throat> any other comments or questions? Is anyone prepared to make a motion about that recommendation? My council went quiet. I see, I see Deputy Mayor. Yeah, yeah um, I'll make the motion to support the recommendation with that added uh, stipulation that the camper be removed. Okay, do I have a second? Councillor Braver for a seconder. Any other conversation? I am seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? <clears throat> that motion has carried. Thank you very much, Adele. <clears throat> We can move on to 12.5 of our agenda, which is finance, and 12.5.1 is Donna Taggart, our CAO creditor. Would you like to speak to this item, please? Yes, thank you, and through you. So before you is a report requesting the use of the Canada Community Building Funding, which is the former gas tax funding, for the Buckhorn Lake Estates water system. So I did provide you a list of categories for which this funding can be used. And one of these include drinking water systems to support conservation, collection, treatment, and distribution. So in 2023, there were two new services unexpectedly required at the Buckhorn Lake Estate System. These services were required due to a total loss of pressure for two properties on the system. The repair required directional drilling to protect the recently asphalted surface of Sumcott Drive and included the installation of a new main saddle, tie-in at the curb stops, and some significant excavation. So therefore, staff are looking for council to receive the report and to direct the CAO treasurer to transfer 33,644.40 from the community building fund under the category of drinking water systems for use at the Buckhorn Lake Estate system. So there will still be about one point two million in the gas tax former gas tax reserve and the plan is to use that funding toward uh, the new fire station in buckhorn because they have opened up that ability in recent years keeping in mind that this funding whenever we receive it has to be used within five years so we'll monitor that 
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Donna Taggart. Do you want to have any questions with Donna in regards to this item? I'm seeing none. Is anyone prepared to make a motion? Councilor mm -hmm. Brown, motion uh, to support the recommendations from staff. Okay, do I have a seconder for that motion? See Councilor Cadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? And seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay. We can move on to 12.6.1 of our agenda, which is on a tag our CAO treasurer. Would you like to speak to this item? Yes, thank you, Mr. You. So before you is the Q4 report for Q4 2023. So as uh, typical, just to highlight a few of the um, initiatives. So there was a submission of a successful loan application for the build of the new facility at the 49th site, completion and presentation of the 2024 draft Trent Lakes budget. There was an increase to be uh, clear in the taxes receivable balance um, in 2023 but we are still 7%, which is uh, well below the provincial threshold and that's 7% of what was billed. The municipality hosted the first meeting of the reestablished joint county meeting with the Township of Selwyn, Curve Lake First Nations and the Township of North Kawartha. <clears throat> there were terms of references finalized for two advisory committees with a recruitment process initiated. initiated. There were also uh, benchmarking reviews of four, 52 short-term rental licensing bylaws and the preparation of a first draft of the short-term rental licensing bylaw for Trent Lakes. Q4 included a gain of 115 social media followers and there were over 100,000 more website pages viewed on the municipality's website between 2022 and 2023. There was an external communication strategy adopted by council. Um, there were continued leveling off of building and planning permit applications during Q4 and overall during the year, but the an overall increase in construction value based on the five-year average. Uh, during Q4, building staff continued to meet or exceed the 48-hour timeline for response for inspections, and there was a radio communications facility protocol developed by planning staff. Fire and emergency services continue to see an increase in call volume with 106 incidents happening during Q4. The total number of incidents in 2023 was 573, taking up 5,241 hours, up from 532, taking 4,737 hours in 2022. 21 firefighters completed some mandatory firefighter courses. There were 263 tons of garbage received, which is consistent with 2022, and a total of 1,228 tons collected in 23, which is down from 2022. Gravel resurfacing, microservicing, microservicing and all capital work, including replacement of the Salmon Lake culvert was completed and the construction of the new joint facility is now at 25%. There were 156 work orders completed by recreation and facility staff taking 504 hours during Q4 with completion of the new playground and lighting at Odenang Park. And you'll also see that Q4 reporting includes an update on all the plans uh, underway right now. So the community strategic economic development and open spaces plan. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's a lot of information. <laughs> thank you very much for that. Anyone have any questions of Don? Uh, yeah, Go more a comment. Uh, Old Nang Park looks amazing with the new playground. I think that we should have a grand opening in council. So thank you, and through you, that is in the works for sure because yep. we receive funding from the province and federal government towards that project. We have to have a ribbon cutting anyway. We just want to wait till the weather gets a bit better. I'm not going to get any better. Well, they it's just like get <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you, Donna. Thank you for your question. Anyone else have any questions? Very thorough report, Donna. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Anyone prepared to make a motion? See, Councillor Brandon. I make a motion to receive. Yeah. And do I have a seconder for that motion? See, Deputy Mayor, I've gone for a seconder. Any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? 
That motion has carried. Thank you very much, Donna. Okay, we can move on to 12.7 of our agenda, which is corporate services. 12.7.1 is Bianca Dragicevic, our deputy clerk, and many other roles. Could you like to speak to this item? <clears throat> Thank you, and through you. Um, this report was drafted um, in response to Council's direction to consider re-establishing um, both the Economic Development Advisory Committee and the Parks and Recreation Culture Advisory Committee. Um, as you, as Council just saw, the quarterly report um, provided, uh, as well as this report, provided an update on the plans that were culminated by these committees um, during the previous term um, and the beginning of this term of Council. Those two plans, namely being the Economic Development, Tourism and Re Recovery Strategic Plan, as well as the Open Spaces Master Plan. Um, this report um, has outlined three options for Council to consider during their decision. Um, and thank you, and I would be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Okay, does anyone on Council have any questions? Councillor Braver, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, it's, more of a, it's more of a comment. Um, do you want to wait until we vote on it? Just a second. We, can make, we have three options here to discuss. Okay. So. All right. Um, I support option one with the following rationale. I've had many conversations with residents uh, who would like to see the Economic Advisory Committee reconstituted. Uh, I, I agree in the sense that a version of an Economic Development Committee could be considered. And, and with that said, I am more inclined to support the idea of forming working groups should opportunities present themselves. Uh, this would allow our residents uh, who may have ideas related to economic development to pursue further research within this within the structure of a working group uh, when i think of economic development i envision enlisting businesses uh, subject matter experts from within and outside our municipality who could provide a vision for attracting business to trent lakes uh, that, that would benefit our municipality financially uh, as Deputy Mayor Armstrong has alluded to in the past, partnering uh, with the private sector is an option uh, who could work with, uh, work in partnership with our municipality to identify and pursue economic opportunities. These opportunities could be identified through the benefit of a working group. This would afford our current economic development staff member the latitude to concentrate on bolstering and building on our current strengths, namely tourism. Uh, there's an opportunity to market our municipality with the goal of highlighting our attributes, including our vast lake systems, our numerous trail systems, as well as supporting our local small businesses. Uh, and I just wanted to share uh, with council uh, and staff and, and everybody, uh, I've spoken, uh, I've had many, many uh, conversations with residents uh, who felt strongly uh, for reconstituting and for uh, working groups. But I just want to uh, I just want to quote. Um, I did receive comments, but I'd like to uh, quote this uh, one comment from one of the residents. Uh, it says, uh, "We must uh, reconstitute the EDAC committee. This is a this is critical to the long term success of uh, the municipality of Trent Lakes. But it needs a different focus uh, than it uh, was in the past. We need to focus on attracting businesses to locate or relocate to Trent Lakes." We need to create jobs in Trent Lakes, and to do that, we need businesses, not just tourism. Tourism helps the existing businesses, but it does not create jobs or create any new commercial tax base. We need more commercial tax base so that we can lessen the burden on the residential tax base. Uh, current state is approximately 97% of our tax dollars collected is from residential tax. This is not sustainable. We need to be calling on and attending events at the Business Advisory Center Peterborough, Invest Peterborough, Startup Peterborough, Eastern Ontario Future Development, and start calling on entrepreneurs and existing <coughs> businesses. Great. Thank you very much for that comment. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Armstrong, go ahead. Uh, ditto, everything <laughs> that was just said. And I would add to that, I, I completely agree. I think we've got now, um, uh, direction, strategic direction from the two main uh, plans that have been developed. I, in the open spaces area, I think we've got staff well positioned to move forward with the implementation of that. Uh, they themselves have identified that as we get 
further along, it may be very beneficial to have a trails committee. Uh, and I certainly agree with that. I don't think we're there yet, um, but I think that's something for consideration. I don't think we need uh, a parks recreation committee at this point in time. Economic development, again, we have an economic development uh, recovery development and tourism plan. And I think our focus should be a laser focus on getting those four main goals implemented. And there may be opportunities for working groups to help uh, move that along. For example, improving the commercial core of Buckhorn to better support residents and visitors is number one. That may uh, be helped by a working group, kind of like a business improvement area uh, organization of businesses in Buckhorn who have a vested interest. They already have a loose sort of organization um, in con conjunction with our new CIP, which I hope is coming soon. <laughs> um, so that might be one focus area where we really could use the energies and the insights and the efforts of our business community. Um, develop a business friendly municipality that supports existing business and is open to new business. I think that's exactly what uh, that comment alluded to. And that can be through our economic development officer working more closely with um, PK, PCAD and others. Uh, and that might be a, you know, a particular working group. But I think the effectiveness comes from focused uh, working groups with very specific deliverables that can help us implement the plans we've now laid out. The comment I reserved earlier was Lakehurst Hall. That wasn't, you know, that wasn't a committee that did that. That was a group that is committed. They're willing to put forth the energy and the efforts towards it, and they came to council. And lo and behold, we have something that we're going to be implementing that aligns with our plan. And you know, they accomplish more in a few sessions, I think, than in some cases our committees have in the past. So I think that's the right approach. Okay, Sorry. You. Thank you very much. Anyway. No, thank you very much. Any other comments? <clears throat> I uh, to support the economic development committee. I I, I don't think that uh, we need uh, the recreation committee at this time, the PRAC, and uh, I I would concur with uh, both uh, Deputy Mayor Armstrong and uh, John uh, Councillor Bo Brayfo. I think they're just talking working groups, not yeah. I think we're saying not not, not, a, not, not 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 any that committee. Okay. But on an as needed basis as we move forward to implement yeah. specific goals, working groups. Any other questions? I just have a comment. I think we have to consider our staff time. If we give them yeah. the studies that we've done that have them busy, they're not going to have a lot of time for other things. I agree with working groups for very site specific and item specific thing or be a great thing. And the Economic Development Advisory Committee will absolutely be reinstated at some point. I just don't think it's right now. I think it's 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 along the stages there, a few steps, but we have a lot to on our plate right now that I think staff are quite capable and willing to do. So. Okay. Del Arbor, go ahead. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just very timely. <laughs> I just wanted Council to know that our planning consultant will be preparing a PowerPoint presentation on the CIP at the next Council meeting, and we're looking at early March to have a um, get-together um, at the Community Centre to invite the public so there's more knowledge about the CIP and the various incentives, so mm -hmm. it's it's coming. <laughs> Well, that's, that's, that's a good news story. Thank you very much, Adele, for sharing that. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Yeah, uh, then I'd like to go ahead and make the motion that we support option one, which is no reestablishment of the committees uh, at this point in time. Do we have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay. <coughs> We have seven. Okay, we can go on now to item 12.7.2 of our agenda, which is Jesse Clark, our Director of Corporate Services and Clark. Can you please speak to this item? Thank you for you, Mayor Lambshead. Just looking for direction on which delegations to request for 
the 2024 OGRA conference, which is happening April 21st to 24th. Uh, delegations are now open and the deadline is March 8th, um, if council wishes to defer this item to the next meeting. Okay, what is the desire of council? I'll defer the item. Okay, I'm gonna defer this item to our next meeting. Do I have a seconder for that motion? I see Councillor Graber for a seconder. Any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Thank you, Jesse Clark. Okay, we can move on to item 13 of our agenda, which is correspondence for information. We have two items on that, like 13.1 and 13.2. We can receive them both at the same time, or we can discuss them, whatever. Go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor. Motion sure. to accept both. Pulling the hallway hall. Sure. Sorry. Okay. Uh, do you have, because they, they had a vote uh, earlier whether they would have pickleball and they decided uh, it, it wasn't appropriate at this time. Okay. And uh, there was a there was a bit of an issue with the the, the tread there uh, going into the office building. Uh, it's raised about three or four inches. A woman came in the other day with heels on. She caught her heel on the on the door tread, and the recommendation from the committee was that maybe fluorescent paint or fluorescent tape should be put on that door tread. Make sure we can pass that along to our facilities. Yeah, and possibly signage. Okay. Because somebody took a real wicked fall. Okay. Thank you very much for bringing that to our attention. We hope they're okay. Okay, Do are you, anyone other conversation on that? Is anyone prepared to make a motion on that item? Motion to receive. Motion to receive. Councillor Braybert for a seconder. Any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Now we can go on to item 13.2, which is the warden's year in review. Anyone want to speak to this item? The warden has been very busy. Go ahead, Councillor Cadigan. Motion to receive. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Franzen for a seconder. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay, we can move on now to item 14 of our agenda, which is correspondence for action. Anyone would like to speak to one item in particular, or are we going to receive them all at the same time? I would like to go ahead. Deputy I'd just Mark. like to pull out 12.4. Uh, or sorry, I have the wrong number here, but the town of Wartonville. Yes. Okay. Anyone prepared to make a motion on the other three? Mr. Braver? Uh, I'd like to pull it uh, 14.1 uh, after uh, Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Okay. Well, let's, we can might all go down through the one at a time. 14.1, City of Sarnia, carbon tax. Go yeah. ahead, Councilor Braver. Just in, in reviewing this uh, correspondence for action, I, I support and I, I agree with all the uh, points mm -hmm. that, that were made uh, by the, uh, by the Sarnia Council. And I also support their uh, resolution. Uh, so I'm uh, in support of this. Uh, okay. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Seeing Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay. Item 14.2 of the agenda, which is. Just admit my report. Are we voting in favor of that? Oh, yes, sir. No, I'm sorry, because sir. two of us would not. Oh. My apologies. That's okay. Okay. Okay, we can move on to 14.2 of our agenda, which is the expand lifespan of fire apparatus. We had a brief conversation with our chief this afternoon. I don't know if anyone's prepared to make a motion or want a question answer or I'll make a comment. Uh, in speaking with the chief, our equipment's in good order. We're replacing it in the 10-year cycle that's recommended. I don't think it applies to us. Okay, thank you very much. You're in there somewhere, a motion. Motion to receive. Okay, do I have a seconder for that motion? Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay. Municipality of Tweed, license plate renewal fees. Anyone want to speak to that or you want to receive that? Or... Councillor Graber, go ahead. Motion to receive. Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Any conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay. Town of Orangeville. 
14.4 of our agenda. Social economic prosperity review. Does someone want to pull that one? Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, I thought we had supported this previously, but maybe it was county. <laughs> um, basically, it's saying that there's an imbalance between um, the funding that the municipality provides and the province provides around all the things that we have responsibility for. And it's just to take a the request is to take a close look at the funding model for all of the services that are provided at the municipal level to see if there's another uh, way that it could be more appropriately funded through the province. So it's a, calling for a consulting review. And I would not, like to make a motion to support it. I would like to second that. <laughs> Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay, we can move on to item 15 of our agenda which is bylaws and we have a amended memorandum agenda memorandum which does it fact could you speak to thank you the three bylaws on today's agenda did not have a corresponding public meeting or staff report the first is to stop up close and sell parts of an original shoreline road allowance and the remaining two are to authorize the acquisition of land for the purpose of road widening as a condition of consent okay we can move on to items 15.1, 2, 3, and 4. If anyone's prepared to make a motion for them all, or we want to speak about one in particular, is that the desire of council? A motion to support all three motions. Okay. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Be Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. <coughs> Any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. We can move on to number 16 of our agenda, which is business arising of a previous meeting. Anyone has any items? We have nine minutes before the committee of adjustments. Seeing no hands, we can move on to item 17, which is notices of motion. Anyone have a notice of motion? Seeing no hands, we can move on to 18, which is information items. And seeing no hands, we can move on to 19, which is our confirming bylaw. Is anyone prepared to make a motion? See, Councilor Franzen for a mover, Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. Any conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We can now move on to item 20 of our agenda and we need a motion to adjourn. See, Councilor Cadigan for a mover and Councilor Braybrook was looking like a seconder. For a seconder, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, staff. Thank you, council. And thank you for everyone that presented today.